flying cars have been promised for decades. From magazine covers in the 1950s to glossy concept videos in the early internet era, the idea has always sounded just close enough to feel inevitable. Anyone who has ever been stuck on a highway crawling along at two miles an hour has probably had the same thought. Why not just lift off and fly over the mess? That fantasy has been reinforced for generations by movies, books, and popular culture. And yet, after more than half a century, most people have never seen a flying car outside of a prototype or a carefully staged demonstration. That long gap between promise and reality raises a more serious question. If flying cars were always such a good idea, why did they fail for so long? And just as importantly, why are they suddenly getting serious attention now, with real companies investing hundreds of millions of dollars instead of just producing concept art? To answer that, it helps to start with a reality check. The core problem was never imagination. Engineers have been able to make vehicles leave the ground for decades. The problem was everything else. Energy density, for example, has always been a brutal constraint. Gasoline contains roughly 12,000 watt-hours of energy per kilogram. Modern lithium-ion batteries, even today, typically deliver around 250 to 300 watt-hours per kilogram at the pack level. That is a gap of nearly two orders of magnitude. How do you lift a vehicle vertically? when your energy source is both heavy and limited? And how do you do it safely, repeatedly, and at a cost that makes any economic sense? This is where the shift toward electric propulsion begins to matter, but also where its limits quickly appear. Electric motors are far simpler than combustion engines. They have fewer moving parts, respond almost instantly, and can be distributed across a vehicle. Instead of one large engine, a flying vehicle can use eight, 10, or even 12 smaller motors. That improves control and adds redundancy. If one motor fails, others can compensate. But redundancy does not come for free. Vertical takeoff demands enormous bursts of power. Many EV tall style designs require several hundred kilowatts just to get airborne. The obvious question then follows, how often can you subject a battery pack to those high power cycles before degradation becomes a major operating cost? Looking at real companies helps ground this discussion in something more concrete. Take Klein Vision and its air car. Instead of vertical takeoff, it uses a fixed wing design and requires a runway, dramatically reducing energy demands. That immediately solves one problem. It avoids the worst battery limitations of vertical lift, but it introduces others. The air car must comply with both automotive and aviation regulations, two regulatory systems that were never designed to overlap. Structurally, the vehicle needs to remain light enough to fly efficiently on the order of roughly one metric ton while still surviving road impacts and meeting crash standards. Mechanically, the folding wing system adds complexity that must work perfectly every time. KleinVision has demonstrated multiple successful test flights, which is no small achievement. But can a design like this scale beyond small production runs? And can it do so at a price point that appeals to more than a narrow niche of buyers? Xpeng approaches the problem from a different direction. As a major electric vehicle maker, Xpeng has explored vertical takeoff concepts aligned with the broader urban air mobility movement. On paper, this looks logical. Xpeng already has experience with electric drivetrains, power electronics, and software. But vertical flight changes the economics and physics of transportation. Hovering is inherently inefficient compared to forward flight. As a result, many current EV tall prototypes target practical ranges of around 20 to 30 miles sometimes less once real-world conditions are considered. Is that range sufficient to justify the cost of infrastructure, certification, and operation? And what happens when battery packs, often costing tens of thousands of dollars, need replacement after a few thousand high-power cycles? Then there is Aleph Aeronautics, which has attracted attention for promoting a vehicle that looks like a conventional car but can take off vertically by rotating its internal structure. The appeal is obvious a flying vehicle that fits within existing road infrastructure. But this concept highlights one of the deepest tensions in the entire flying car idea. Cars are designed to maximize traction, durability, and crash safety. Aircraft are designed to minimize weight, reduce drag, and generate lift efficiently. Can one vehicle truly satisfy both sets of goals, or does it inevitably become a compromise? Aleph's publicly discussed flight range and payload numbers remain modest, which does not make the idea meaningless, but does frame it as a very specific solution rather than a universal one. These examples point to an uncomfortable but important reality. 
Flying cars are not blocked by a single missing breakthrough. They are constrained by many small limitations that stack on top of each other. Battery energy density, thermal management, noise, certification, maintenance, insurance, consider noise alone. Even electric rotors generate significant sound, especially during the takeoff and landing. Urban noise regulations are far stricter than most people realize. Can flying vehicles operate frequently over dense neighborhoods without provoking public backlash? And if they cannot, where exactly do they fit into the transportation system? Economics adds another layer of complexity. Helicopters already exist and solve many of the same problems flying cars aim to address. But helicopters are expensive to buy, expensive to maintain, and require highly trained pilots. Electric flying vehicles promise lower maintenance and eventually higher levels of automation. But those savings must offset battery replacement costs, charging infrastructure, regulatory compliance, and insurance. This is why most serious companies have quietly moved away from the idea of selling flying cars to everyone. Instead, they talk about fleets, services, and controlled routes. Not mass adoption, but selective deployment. Does that make flying cars less revolutionary or simply more realistic? Regulation ultimately shapes everything. Aviation safety standards are far more demanding than automotive ones. A car can break down safely by pulling over. An aircraft cannot. In aviation, failure is a life-threatening event, not only for passengers, but also for people on the ground. That is why certification takes years, not months. In 2019, European regulators introduced special certification conditions for VTOL aircraft carrying up to nine passengers with a maximum takeoff weight of about 7,000 pounds. That move signaled something important. Regulators were beginning to adapt to a new category of aircraft. But adaptation does not mean approval is easy, fast, or guaranteed. So when people ask why flying cars are suddenly being taken seriously, the answer is not that the dream has suddenly become easy. It is that the conversation has become more honest. Electric propulsion, modern software, Improved materials and better manufacturing have removed some barriers, but not all. Companies like Klein Vision, Xpeng, and Aleph Aeronautics are not chasing fantasy. They are navigating trade-offs. And those trade-offs explain both the renewed interest and the persistent skepticism. Which leads to the more useful question. Not will flying cars replace cars, but where do they actually make sense? How many flights per day would justify the cost? How much time must be saved to offset higher prices? And how much complexity are cities and regulators willing to accept? Flying cars have not arrived as a mass market reality, but they have crossed a more subtle threshold, from being dismissed outright to being examined seriously. And in technology, that shift alone is worth paying attention to. If flying cars are this complex, constrained, and expensive to build, a reasonable question naturally follows. Why are companies still pursuing them? And more importantly, how could something so costly ever become a profitable business? The answer lies not in mass adoption, but in pricing, utilization, and the kind of transportation problem flying vehicles are actually meant to solve. To begin with, it helps to look at real prices rather than optimistic forecasts. Basic rotable aircraft such as the Samson Switchable are priced around $170,000. More advanced vehicles capable of transitioning between road and air regularly sell for far more. High-end flying cars and car aircraft hybrids typically fall between $500,000 and well over $1 million. The two-seat air car, for example, has been estimated to cost anywhere from roughly $500,000 to about $1.1 million, depending on configuration and production scale. A separate analysis conducted in the United Kingdom found that the average purchase price of a flying car was approximately 495,000 pounds, or around 630,000 US dollars, before licensing fees and additional costs were even considered. That immediately places flying cars in a completely different financial category from conventional automobiles. A $35,000 sedan, or even a $100,000 luxury car, is simply not a meaningful comparison. Flying cars are closer, economically speaking, to light aircraft than to road vehicles, and that is not an accident. They are built to aviation standards, not automotive ones. The materials, redundancy, testing, and certification requirements are far more demanding. The question then becomes, are these prices a permanent barrier, or are they a reflection of early-stage technology? 
supporters often argue that today's prices reflect early production volumes and that costs could fall significantly with scale. Some projections suggest that prices might eventually decline into the $150,000 to $250,000 range as manufacturing matures. But those projections usually come with an important caveat. That scenario is many years away. In the near term, flying cars remain capital-intensive machines built for early adopters, not for the mass market. And price is only the beginning of the cost story. You cannot simply buy a flying car and start using it. Training and licensing add a substantial upfront expense. Estimates from the UK suggest that pilot licensing and training alone could cost around $35,000. That is equivalent to buying another new car, simply to learn how to operate the first one. Is that unreasonable? Not really. You are not just driving. You are flying an aircraft. But it does change the economics. It raises the barrier to entry and narrows the pool of potential private owners even further. Operating costs add another layer of complexity. Maintenance costs for EV tolls and flying cars remain uncertain because only a small number of vehicles are currently in regular use. Electric propulsion does reduce some mechanical maintenance compared to combustion engines, but aviation-grade components, battery replacements, specialized inspections, and dual certification requirements all carry significant costs. Early estimates for total operating cost in high-utilization urban air mobility scenarios suggest figures around $2.97 per passenger seat mile. Importantly, that number includes both acquisition and operating costs, not just routine maintenance. When analysts isolate direct operating costs, estimates vary widely. Some feasibility studies for electric aircraft suggest operating costs as low as 25 to 75 cents per mile flown. But those figures typically exclude fixed costs, such as insurance, storage, and certification. Other analyses estimate costs closer to $3.50 per mile once all factors are considered. Early projections for EV tall air taxi services place per passenger mile costs anywhere from about $2.25 to as high as $11, depending on utilization, energy prices, and maintenance assumptions. These numbers are not trivial. So why would anyone think this makes economic sense? The answer lies in how flying vehicles are expected to be used. Profitability does not depend on selling millions of vehicles. It depends on keeping a smaller number of vehicles flying as often as possible. This is the same logic that governs commercial aviation. An aircraft that flies one hour a day is a financial failure. An aircraft that flies 10 hours a day can be profitable even if its purchase price is high. The same principle applies here. Flying cars and EVTOLs are not designed to sit idle in personal garages. They are designed for fleets, routes, and high utilization. This is where the value proposition becomes clearer. Flying vehicles are not competing with economy cars. They're competing with time. A 20 to 30 mile trip that takes 90 minutes on congested roads might take 10 to 15 minutes in the air. For certain passengers, business travelers, medical transport, time critical logistics, that time savings has real monetary value. The question is not whether everyone will pay for it, but whether enough people will. Energy costs further support this model. Studies of electric aircraft suggest energy costs as low as $8 to $12 for a 100-mile flight, compared to roughly $400 in fuel for a conventional aircraft covering the same distance. That difference is substantial. While these figures do not include all costs, they highlight why electric propulsion is so attractive. If energy remains a small fraction of total operating cost, then improvements in battery technology and charging efficiency directly improve margins. Still, it would be misleading to suggest that flying cars are on the verge of becoming cheap. Even optimistic scenarios suggest that per-passenger mile costs might eventually fall to around $1.50 in mature urban air mobility systems. That is competitive with premium ground transportation, not with everyday commuting. And that distinction matters. Flying cars are not about replacing cars. They are about serving specific high-value routes where speed matters more than cost. So why are companies willing to invest billions collectively into this space? Because the upside, while narrow, is significant. If even a small percentage of urban trips shift to air, the revenue potential is enormous. Analysts estimate the global urban air mobility market could approach $1.5 trillion by 2040. 
That figure assumes selective adoption, not universal use. It assumes fleets, not garages. And it assumes prices remain high enough to support the infrastructure required to operate safely. This brings us back to price. High prices are not a flaw of flying cars. They are a prerequisite. Certification alone can cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Redundancy requirements add hardware. Insurance costs reflect aviation level risk. Batteries must be replaced periodically. All of this demands pricing that reflects reality, not consumer expectations shaped by the automotive market. So when critics point to six-figure or seven-figure price tags and declare flying cars a failure, they may be asking the wrong question. The more relevant question is whether a limited number of expensive vehicles, operated intensively, can generate enough revenue to justify their costs. History suggests this is possible. Helicopters already do it, albeit imperfectly. Flying cars and EV tolls are an attempt to improve on that model, not to democratize flight overnight. In that sense, flying cars are not a consumer product waiting to get cheaper. They are an aviation service waiting to become efficient. And whether they succeed will depend less on how low prices fall and more on how well companies manage utilization, regulation, and public acceptance. That is where the real profit or loss will be decided. Looking ahead, the future of flying cars is best understood not as a sudden breakthrough, but as a gradual progression through clearly defined phases. Over the next five to ten years, the industry is likely to remain focused on proof rather than scale. The immediate priority is not mass deployment, but certification, safety validation, and controlled operations. In this phase, flying vehicles will appear only in limited environments, airport to downtown routes, medical transport corridors, and highly regulated urban zones. This is the expensive stage. Capital will be consumed faster than revenue is generated, and most projects will not survive. That outcome is not a failure of the concept. It is a normal filtering process in aviation. If this first phase succeeds, the next stage, the early 2030s, will be defined by standardization rather than expansion. This is when regulators, operators, and manufacturers begin to agree on common rules. Noise thresholds, air corridors, vertiport designs, and operating procedures. Costs will not collapse, but they will stabilize. Flying vehicles will increasingly be treated as infrastructure-backed services rather than experimental machines. Importantly, this is also when the industry will stop talking about ownership almost entirely. The dominant model will be fleet-based, with utilization, not unit sales, determining success or failure. Beyond that, in the longer term, flying cars are likely to scale geographically rather than socially. They will expand into cities where congestion, geography, and economic density justify their existence. Mountainous regions, island clusters, megacities with saturated ground infrastructure, these are the environments where urban air mobility makes sense. What they will not become is a universal consumer product. There will be no flying car in every garage. Airspace, noise, safety, and regulatory complexity make that vision unworkable, regardless of technological progress. Flying cars are not waiting for a single breakthrough or a single visionary to make them real. They are waiting for alignment between technology, economics, regulation, and public acceptance. That alignment takes time, and the companies watching most closely are also the ones moving most carefully. Are flying cars a serious next step in transportation? or another expensive solution searching for a real problem? And if even companies like Tesla are staying out, does that signal caution or simply a missed opportunity?